So I'm glad I have a microphone. Uh, you just had to pay a little closer attention, I guess, uh, with your ears. <clears throat> but uh, Don gave me too much credit. I had nothing to do, uh, really, with the giveaway. Uh, that was all Emma and her idea and her organization and execution, so I'm thankful for her and her servant heart, but also for all of those that gave freely, uh, almost uh, to the point where we felt like Moses and had to say, uh, we've got enough material for the tabernacle, uh, or for the, um, yeah, the tabernacle, uh, and, and please quit giving. We have uh, an abundance and so, I don't know how much we gave away yesterday. I don't know how many people came to the, through the door, but there were several hundreds. Uh, they were all very kind. They were all very appreciative. Uh, and so, without your uh, giving spirit and, and your willingness to uh, set up and, and to work that yesterday, uh, it wouldn't have happened. So, thank you so much. Um, if anything was accomplished yesterday, if anything was accomplished, my prayer was that the community knows that they are loved by the Portland Church of Christ. That's, that's our goal. Uh, and I ask you to continue to pray for all those that, that benefited from that, uh, that the seeds that were planted, that they may bear fruit to some extent, and who knows uh, where that will lead. And it's our prayer that maybe we'll see them in our services or in Bible class or come across their paths again, and we can recognize them, maybe they will recognize us. Uh, if you're doing Bible bingo, today is the day that we start uh, handing out candy again. Um, I'm not going to set an age limit on it, because I've seen some older kids, we might say, grab a few of them. Uh, so if you can, Jake, was that you that you raised? You got one? Excellent. Very good. We know Jake will pay attention today because there's a piece of candy at the end of the road. <laughs> so come see me and show me that and I'll give you a piece of candy. August 11th, uh, we're going to do a trial run again, or for the first time, but just announcing again. Uh, I don't have it all put together yet, but any and everybody that not only wants to participate, but also just wants a meal, if that will relieve stress before Wednesday night. Uh, let us know. There will be a simple church sign-up that I think will be published later today. Um, and just give your family name. It's like the TNT. Give your family name and how many uh, that you uh, are bringing with your family. And then we'll, we'll make, make preparations for there. We'll kind of see how we're going to go about this as we begin then to open up to the community uh, the first uh, Wednesday night in September. All right, are you ready for Matthew 7 and verse 24, the Bible, our memory verse? Uh, Jesus is closing the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, Everyone, all right, very, very good, wonderful. Our, our next verse for next week will be Matthew 7 and verse uh, 25, And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And that is your memory verse for next week. <clears throat> As we've been doing every first Sunday of the month this year, we've had a, I guess, a year-long uh, sermon series, or just, uh, it's on the first Sunday of the month, the Be More. We're just looking at different aspects that perhaps we need to grow in our life and, and, and reflect them to a greater degree as we are striving to be like Jesus. <clears throat> I want to start with a question. Where does your mind go when you seek to escape the pressures of life? When maybe the stress at work seems uh, to be becoming unbearable. When your schedule becomes tight. When things uh, of just maybe the circumstances of life begin to, to weigh on you and feel heavy. When loneliness creeps in. When prayers seem unanswered, when hopelessness creeps into your life, when, when life feels like it's crumbling around you, where does your mind escape? Where does it go? Maybe some of you, it goes to the beach, and you can see yourself sitting with your toes in the sand and the breeze blowing, and you hear the waves you know, crashing onto the shore, and just immediately you kind of feel like the stress has been lifted. 
my mind, it goes to a secluded cabin in the woods um, where nobody else is around, and I can hear the stream, you know, uh, going over the rocks. To me, that, that is peaceful. For some of you, and I can't understand why, maybe your mind goes to the golf course. That seems like more stress than what my life would already be about. But maybe some of you, it goes to the lake, and you're know, just out on the boat fishing and just relaxing and, and enjoying yourself. Where does your mind go? For the Apostle Paul, his mind escaped with thoughts of eternity. He says this, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient or temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Paul says, <clears throat> the idea is, when you begin to feel rotten inside that seems to be the idea of losing heart he says we so we do not lose heart when you begin to feel just rotten and just tired and just worn out in life because things don't seem to be what they're supposed to be he says let your inner self let your mind see the unseen let your mind see what can't be seen with your eyes, but can only be seen with your mind. Don't let your mind transport you to the beach or to the mountains or the golf course or the lake or, or wherever. It is. Don't let your mind go there. Paul says if you want to renew the inner self, let your mind escape and find rest and be renewed by thoughts of eternity before the throne of God. Let your mind go where things last. Eternity. Church, we need to be more eternally minded. Our minds need, not that we can grasp eternity, but our minds need to be there constantly, consistently. If we're going to make it through this life, imagine what your life would be like if you were able to step back into the mess of daily activities with your mind set on eternity. How would today be different? How would tomorrow be different? Or the next day be different if we brought the hope of heaven into the mess of daily life? How would your life change? One author said, what if the temporary was decorated with things from above? I like that. What if the things that are temporary were decorated with the things from above? Above. The Spirit directs our minds to eternity with words, uh, again, of Paul that were read just a minute ago. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things that are above, not on things of the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. The Spirit is directing our minds here through Paul and explains, if you have chosen to die with Christ, and we know from the previous verses in Colossians chapter 2 that the Colossians had decided to do that. They had died with Christ. They had been immersed, in their, their, immersed their lives into his life. He says, then your mind ought to be in the habit of thinking about and being focused on Jesus. Our minds ought to increasingly be thinking about eternity Etern eternally minded <clears throat> it doesn't mean that we don't care about the things of this world being eternally minded means we live now in light of then and we live here in light of there being eternally minded affects everything that you do right now because what you do right now ought to be done with eternity in mind so let's see what the bible has to say this is just a a small sampling of what the bible has to say about being eternally minded or directing our minds that way the psalmist teaches us to number our days that we may gain or get a heart of wisdom psalm 90 in verse 12 why would he say that well i think there's a, a new testament equivalent to that james says uh, <clears throat> that 
your life is like a mist or a vapor. It's here for a little while and then it vanishes away, James 4 and verse 14. Life is temporary and the Bible makes that very clear. And since we know that life is temporary, our minds ought to think on what lasts, eternity. After Paul writes about wanting to know more about Jesus and the power of his resurrection, and Paul says that he even wants to share in the sufferings of Jesus and probably seems to, that he prays that from time to time, this is what he says in Philippians 3. He says, not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. He says, I forget about what lies behind and I'm straining or pressing forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And now listen to how he rounds this out. He says, let those of us who are mature think this way. He says, the mature Christian isn't thinking about what's behind him. He's thinking about what's ahead of him. Not only in striving to be like Jesus, but the ultimate reward that that day's coming where we will inherit eternity, where this, imper or this perishable will put on the imperishable, where this corruptible will put on the incorruptible. He says you've got to be thinking this way because it affects everything that you do in this life. Paul addresses the wealthy as he writes to the church in Ephesus by way of, of Timothy, wanting Timothy to relay these things to that church. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17, he says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Why not set your hopes on earthly riches? Well, they won't last, right? They're temporary. I mean, they, they may be great, they may be good, they could be wonderful blessings. But when we set our hope on those things, guess where our hope is not? It's not in and on Jesus, the one and the only one who can save us, the one that we're going to stand before and give an account. Why did you set your hope on earthly riches? I am your hope. Hebrews 11, <clears throat> turn there if you will. Hebrews 11, Paul is, or some think, people think it's Paul, there are uh, theories and thoughts that could be several other different writers, we're not sure. Uh, but in Hebrews 11, there are several individuals listed here that are great people of faith. And look at what he says, and starting in verse 12. Therefore, from one man... And him as good as dead were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. It's not that they saw them with their eyes, they saw them with their minds. And having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. And if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Their minds were on eternity. And so he says, therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Peter tells us to set our hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus, 1 Peter 1 and verse 13. If we're going to live in active anticipation of the return of Jesus, then our minds, or we do that by setting our minds on things that are eternal. 1 John 2 and verse 15, very well known verse talking about things that are temporary John says do not love the world or the things in the world if anyone loves the world the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of possessions 
is not from the Father, but is from the world, and the world is passing away. Again, it's that concept. This, this is all, all that you can see is temporary. It's not here to stay. It's passing away with all its desires. Whoever does the will of God abides forever. He's directing our minds, again, on the things that are eternal. And then Matthew chapter 6 records the words of Jesus as he directs our minds in the same way. Chapter 6, 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy where thieves break in and steal. Jesus isn't saying that you can't have things in this life, right? That's not what he's saying. Uh, but the idea is the things in this life better not be what you treasure the most. He says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Everything here in this earth has the potential to be taken away from us at a, at a moment's notice. I can drive home and find out that my, my house is burning down and it's, and it's gone. I, I could wake up in the morning and, and my car that I left parked in my driveway could be could have vanished. Who knows? These things shouldn't be my treasure. I shouldn't hold on to something so tightly in this world that I can't let it go if it was taken away from me. But Jesus says the treasures that you, lay on, that you lay hold of ought to be laid up in heaven because those things can't be taken away from you. So living eternally minded, how do we do it? An eternal mindset doesn't overlook the fact that we live on this earth, but an eternal mindset transforms how we live on this earth and how we view the things. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 3 from our scripture reading. And continue in that passage, and we'll see how Paul continues to direct our minds. <clears throat> because an eternally focused mind will transform your thinking, it will transform your behavior. Uh, and let's, let's see what, what Paul has to say. In chapter 3, verses 5 through 9, Paul tells us that a, 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 a living eternally minded, someone who's thinking about eternity, that they will put to death fleshly desires that's the carnal desires of this life he says put to death therefore what is earthly in you sexual morality impurity passions evil desire and covetousness which is idolatry on account of these things the wrath of God is coming and these you too once walked when you were living in them but now you must put them all away anger wrath malice slander Obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices. When we are immersed into Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven, and we, we stay in Jesus, we abide in Him, and we live in Him, then all of these things are going to be slowly put to death. And as those things are slowly put to death, then we see and we replace them with the character of Jesus. In some instances, it's faster than others. Some, it may almost seem immediate, but some, it's going to take a little bit longer as they struggle with things and, and, and they're being uh, uh, transformed. But someone who's thinking about eternity begins to put to death their sinful nature. Number two, not only do they do away with the, the bad, but they adopt the good. If you, you can't do away with a, a, a bad behavior if you don't put a good behavior in its place. And we allow, it's not what we choose, we're allowing God to put that there and work in that through His Spirit. Put on the heavenly clothing of a compassionate heart, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. All of those we're working on, right? We have room to improve. We, we need to continue to practice those things. In our homes, and those that we deal with on a daily basis, and with our brothers and sisters here in Christ. But living eternally minded, you're also quick to forgive. Colossians 3 and verse 13, bear with one another, and, for, and, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. In a world that's quick to accuse and hold grudges, an eternally minded person is quick to forgive. 
It doesn't mean you're being taken advantage of. Showing forgiveness and granting forgiveness doesn't mean you're allowing someone to walk over you. It means you're allowing the Spirit to continue to transform your life so that you can be like Jesus. Verse 14, and above all these, put on love, which binds together or everything together in perfect harmony. An eternally minded person is going to retaliate with love. You know, we're not to repay evil for evil. We're to use and live out in love. And so that's seen in our actions, not just in our words, but the way that we deal with people. Yesterday was a great example of us loving on our community. We need, I know we can't do it on a grand scale like that all the time, but you can find ways in your life to live out God's love on a daily basis. Verse 15. Allow the peace and thankfulness of Christ to rule your hearts. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. How does it seem like some people just seem to be so peaceful and thankful when it, it appears that everything in their life is falling apart? Can I suggest that they're eternally minded? They're not dwelling exactly what is going, not that they don't give any thought to what's going on in the circumstance, but more thought to what is going on in eternity and what is going to happen in the future. Allow the peace and thankfulness of Christ to rule in your hearts, but also allow the word of Christ to dwell in your heart and live with a song in your heart. Verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. I want to tell you about a young man named Colin that we know uh, from camp. This guy, I've never in my life seen somebody work so hard and be so happy about it. I don't care what you ask him to do. He's going to do it with a smile on his face. One night at midnight, he had... Uh, the, the, the snake that used when drains were stopped up because the camp kitchen, the drains were stopped up and was bubbling up. And at midnight, he went and got the snake and began to work and was whistling as it was going on. There's someone who lets the word of Christ dwell in their heart and they have a song in their heart. How, I mean, this guy's praising God at midnight while he's working and doing something nasty and gross. That's what it looks like. He's eternally minded. He's thinking about that. And then verses 17 through chapter 4 and verse 1. Seek to commit every act to the glory of Jesus. When was the last time that you got up in the morning and you said in your mind, everything I do today, I'm going to do with Jesus in mind. And I'm going to have that. I'm going to be try to, my best to be consciously aware of everything that I do. And as soon as I start to do something I shouldn't do, I'm like, oh, I can't do that to the glory of God. I've got to change some behavior and, and do this instead. And then go make disciples. The Great Commission. Jesus says, go into the world and make disciples. Teach them everything I've commanded you. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he says, you do that, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you always. And how can you not be eternally minded when you know that Jesus is with you always? Let me try to put this in perspective very quickly. <clears throat> in 2020, I'm going to give you some averages here. You, depending on what website you look at, they may be a little, little bit different. But in 2020, the average life expectancy in the U.S., was 77.8 years of age. The average retirement age in 2020 was 66.8 years old. You do the math, and then the average person enjoys 11 years of retirement before they die. Now, keep that in mind. 11 years of retirement, that's the average, uh, before you die. Let's assume the same person started school at the age of, of five years old and, and they went to school, graduated college, got a job, and worked up to the average age of retirement. That means they spent 61.8 years of their life 
to enjoy the last 11. How much of that 61 years of life was spent invested, investing in eternity? Think about it. How many of us thinking about, dreaming about the day you get to retire and enjoy life, they say? How many of us think about the day that Jesus is returning and then we are ushered into eternity? Church, we need to set aside the pressing business of the day and take time to remember that you're going to heaven. There are things that matter far more than the things in this life. And very soon, any of us could be whisked away to be an eternal holiday and open our eyes in what the Hebrew writer says, the better country that we long for. And we'll be at home with Jesus. And we'll see him face to face. The return of Jesus and the end of all things as we know it is nearer at this moment than it ever has been. What are you living for? Who are you living for? Are you living with eternity in mind? If you're not, <clears throat> I would suggest you need to think about it. Spend some time in some contemplative meditation and think. And look and see what God is trying to show to you and reveal to you about life and how it's supposed to be lived and what's really important in life. Maybe you need to make some changes. Maybe there's some here who are ready to change your life forever. Through obedience to the gospel, by repenting of your, your sins and being immersed into Jesus, to be raised to walk a life immersed in Jesus and going and making disciples. Maybe you just need prayers. Maybe you need to be uh, somebody to reach down and help pick you back up and, and walk through a, a messy season of life with you. We're willing to do that as well. Whatever your need is, please come forward while we stand and while we sing. <clears throat>